Modern Warfare 2, the game that blazed the path forward for the gaming industry to be what it is today, for better and for worse. Released more than 12 years ago, Modern Warfare 2 sold approximately 4.7 million units in the United States and the UK combined within its first 24 hours. The total revenue from first day sales in the US and the UK was 310 million, making Modern Warfare 2 the biggest entertainment launch in the history at the time, surpassing its predecessor Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. As of January 18th, 2010, it has made over $1 billion in sales, and as of October 2019, the game has sold 25.02 million copies. If only the story stopped there. The tale of Modern Warfare 2 is tainted with corporate greed, multi-million dollar lawsuits, and personal hardships, the ripples of which can still be felt to this day. This is the hidden story of Modern Warfare 2. Our story starts all the way back in May of 2002, when Vince Sempella, Grant Collier, and Jason West established Infinity Ward. They and a team of 22 employees migrated over to this new company from 2015 Incorporated, the team responsible for creating Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Can one man truly make a difference? This new team would find themselves in need of funding to actually make a game, which caused them to eventually make a deal with Activision. The initial terms of the deal allowed Activision to buy a 30% stake in the company, with the option to fully buy the company after, which they did a year later. Infinity Ward, under Activision, would go on to make Call of Duty 1, Call of Duty 2, and most notably Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Activision was initially hesitant to venture from the World War II era, the time period where most FPS games took place at the time. But after some convincing, COD 4 was made and oh boy were Activision happy about it. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare released in November of 2007, scored unmatched critical acclaim and almost broke every record imaginable. It sold over 10 million copies in its first year after release, an amount unheard of in the gaming industry at the time. Needless to say, Activision wanted a sequel. But behind closed doors, Vince Pella and Jason West, the two heads of Infinity Ward, were not as eager. They were starting to get worried that all they would ever make is Call of Duty. And with Treyarch, another company under Activision, making a new Call of Duty every year after Infinity Ward, it was easy to see why. If these games kept making money, Activision would keep demanding more. Spoiler alert, they were right. But Vince and Jason had bigger dreams. They wanted to make a new IP or intellectual property. So, they took their concerns to Activision, and after some back and forth, a new contract was signed by both parties. This contract was a memorandum of understanding and was signed on March 13th, 2008. This document isn't super long, but I want to highlight the really important parts right now. The first thing is that Infinity Ward would make Modern Warfare 2 and have it released by November 15th, 2009. In return, Infinity Ward would be free to pick its next title and make whatever game they wanted with full creative freedom. Vince and Jason would also gain the rights to all modern Call of Duty titles as well as Modern Warfare games. On top of all that, both would receive more money and extra bonuses. There was a non-solicitation clause, however, as well as a really important continued employment section that reads, should both members of Infinity Ward management no longer be employed by Infinity Ward, the operational and creative authority provided by Infinity Ward and Infinity Ward management under sections 2A and B will be immediately rescinded and of no further force and effect, and any unearned and or uninvested compensation shall be immediately terminated and Activision shall have no further obligation to pay out such compensation. In other words, this was everything they wanted to hear and more, but if they left or were fired, they would lose it all. Vince and Jason were a bit worried about that last part, but when questioned about it, Bobby Kotick, CEO of Activision, stated, quote, Don't worry about it. It's impossible for you guys to be fired. You're in the big leagues now, and pointed at himself. Remember that conversation, as it will come into play later. With a new deal in hand, the team went to work on Modern Warfare 2. Two thousand nine, the announcement of Modern Warfare Two. Electricity was in the air, and every gamer who was anybody was closely following the trailers and interviews. New perks, new maps, the first sequel ever made. It seemed that every piece of information shared was a hit, and the hype continued to build. Even here, however, you can see the effects of the MOU in action. The game was being marketed as Modern Warfare Two, not Call of Duty Modern Warfare Two. Which, following the rights now being under control of Vince and Jason, and their want to break away from the Call of Duty brand, makes a lot of sense. They released a teaser trailer, a reveal trailer, and two multiplayer related videos without using the Call of Duty title. When asked about it in March of 2009, an Activision US representative said, Modern Warfare has taken on such a life of its own, it has become our focus now. 
which at first glance seems to indicate support for the title change, but if you dig deeper, it's a bit of a non-answer. The writer of the article is also a bit confused, questioning whether or not Modern Warfare 2 is its own series now. The question will be short-lived, however, as in July, Call of Duty was added back into the name. When questioned, Activision had this to say, quote, Infinity Ward's Modern Warfare 2 is the direct sequel to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Quote, we have focused our attention on Modern Warfare in order to most effectively communicate the fact that this is the first true sequel in the Call of Duty series. Infinity Ward, the original creators of the Call of Duty franchise, have said from the beginning Modern Warfare 2 resides in the Call of Duty universe. This is reflected in the title's package. I personally think it's interesting that the phrasing Modern Warfare is the focus was given in both answers. Internally, Activision would claim they did surveys which indicated that there was less brand awareness for the game without the Call of Duty name, which would affect sales, but I could find no actual evidence of these surveys. Not much is known about the relationship between Infinity Ward and Activision at this time, but I think the issues had only gotten worse. If you watch the credits, all Infinity Ward employees and other people or companies that help the game appear in a slow-moving text with game images in the background. Activision, however, isn't until the very end and is done over a black screen and the text is sped up so it lasts only 25 seconds. On the final product, the name Call of Duty is printed in small text on the box. When you load up Modern Warfare 2, however, the name Call of Duty doesn't appear anywhere. I think this old interview with Vince I found really sums up his feelings on Activision at the time. Notice how he seems to give his actual answer, then he realizes his mistake and seems to give a more corporate answer. There was that story a few days ago that came out about kind of you guys wanting to make Modern Warfare modern and... and Activision people wanted to keep it in World War Two. I'm curious, kind of after after success of of Modern Warfare, does that kind of buy you the license to do whatever you want at this point? Yeah, well, I guess we'll see, huh? <laughs> You'd think so, but yeah, you never know. Yeah. Never know how Is things there go. You had to fight for to get in Modern Warfare Two. Um, the development of the game and what the actual project is, you know, they they leave us alone and, and let us do our thing. You know, where kind of where the worlds collide is in that kind of the marketing areas, marketing and sales. So that's, you know, we'll go head to head a little bit on, you know, what we want the marketing to be and, and where and how and Can game game wise. It's, no, no, that would be okay. terrible of me to do. Yeah. Interesting to say the least. All of this came to a head when on March 2nd, 2010, a few months into Modern Warfare 2's life cycle, Vince and Jason were fired for breaches of contract and insubordination. This shocked the whole gaming industry because at the time, the public had very little insight into the issue at hand, and the two had literally just delivered the biggest game in history. Jason and Vince then started a lawsuit against Activision for $36 million, stating they had not been paid all their royalties for Modern Warfare 2. Soon after, on April 27, 2010, 38 employees from Infinity Ward also sued Activision, referring to themselves as the Infinity Ward Employment Group. They sought between $75 million and $125 million for unpaid bonuses and other compensation from Modern Warfare 2 sales. These suits would go on for some time. While this was happening, Jason and Vince formed Respawn Entertainment under EA, a new game studio formed of 38 members of Infinity Ward who quit following the firing of Jason and Vince. Many of these were also members of the Infinity Ward employment group. So, this more or less sets the stage for the lawsuits. There was a lot of background info needed to get us up to speed for the suits, but from here on, it's going to be a little bit more of a looser format. I want to look at each side individually and see what conclusions we can draw at the end. A couple of forewords. I do not have access to all the court documents. I could not find them all despite my best efforts. It's possible more may be out there, but I could not find any. Also, for the Activision side, there was a large redaction process. Now, I'm still a bit unsure about the process of redaction in a legal setting, and I'm not sure what I'm allowed to talk about regarding those redactions, so I'll vaguely talk about them, but leave the fully unredacted document in the description if you would like to go see for yourself. Alright, let's start with Activision's case. Activision's central argument is that Vince and Jason met and conspired with EA to leave Activision and steal both people and company assets. In fact, Activision even dragged EA into the lawsuit at one point and countersued for $400 million. Quote, 
Activision alleges that Electronic Arts conspired with two former senior Activision executives, Weston Zimpella, to derail Activision's Call of Duty franchise, disrupt its Infinity Ward development studio, and inflict serious harm to the company. A pretty bold claim, but can they prove it? Well, kind of. Like I said before, there are a series of redactions done to this document after the fact. Most of these redactions are of emails between heads of EA and various others, Vince and Jason included. Again, I'm not going to show these in the video, but let's just say it proves that there were meetings between EA executives and Vince and Jason. Now, the two did admit to these meetings, but they claimed they were innocent meetings. Activision claims that these meetings were enough to break the no solicitation clause of the MOU. Speaking of the MOU, Activision uses it in earlier contracts that Vince and Jason signed in a lot of their arguments. One weird thing I noticed was the fact that while they constantly use the MOU in their argument, they refused to actually attach the document to the case. Quote, The MOU is confidential pursuant to terms set forth therein. As a result, the MOU is not attached hereto. However, Activision pleads the legal effects of the MOU herein without waiving the confidential nature of the document. It does seem a bit hypocritical to complain about EA trying to keep documents hidden while keeping your main document hidden. At this point, Activision claims that the meetings with EA had created a conflict of interest, where not only were they breaking the no solicitation clause of the MOU, but were also actively trying to hurt Activision from the inside. Quote, As alleged above, West and Zimpella have breached the MOU by interfering with Activision's ability to publish and market Modern Warfare 2 by, among other things, failing to include the Activision logo in the game and refusing Activision's request to remedy that failure. West and Zimpella have further breached the MOU by openly criticizing Activision, which interfere with Activision's ability to market Modern Warfare 2. All of this, Activision argues, breaks both the MOU and past contracts that the two had signed and was more than enough evidence to support firing both of them. On top of that, Activision countersued both Vince and Jason, as well as EA, for damages suffered throughout this entire event. Quote, as a proximate result of Weston Zimpella's actions, Activision has suffered and will continue to suffer damages in the amount to be proven at trial. Further, as a result of Weston Zimpella's disloyalty, they are no longer entitled to any compensation, neither any due now nor yet to become due, and Activision is entitled to recover all past payments, compensation, equity, and benefits made to Weston Zimpella during the period of their disloyalty. Before we move on, I want to highlight a few more things about this document. First, it seems as though Activision is eager to go to trial, as they mention it multiple times in the document. I suspect, given the outcome of the suit, which we'll detail in a little bit, this was a scare tactic to make Jason and Vince cave early. Second, I want to show just how vicious Activision are in this document. At times, it seems less like a court document and more like a personal character attack. Quote, Laying the groundwork for this scheme while still employed as studio heads and Activision's fiduciaries, these disloyal executives actively sought to alienate Infinity Ward employees from Activision. Quote, emboldened by their secret alliance with Electronic Arts. And at other times, they just sit there and brag about themselves. Quote, for the better part of a decade, Activision's Infinity Ward studio has developed entirely with Activision's capital and with the aid and assistance of numerous Activision resources, including talented people from all across Activision, high quality, commercially and critically successful games that are recognized as among the gaming industry's most successful products. Quote, the efforts of Activision and its Infinity Ward and Treyarch Studios have made the Call of Duty franchise one of the most successful video game franchises enjoyed by tens of millions of gamers. Quote, the series reached even bigger audiences when the setting was shifted to the modern battlefield in Infinity Ward's first Modern Warfare title. I find that last one particularly amusing, considering that Activision initially did not want to switch to the modern era, and it was Jason and Vince who convinced them. Regardless, there are many more examples of Activision talking themselves up, but I think you get the idea. Perhaps the most interesting and hilarious section of the whole document is section F, titled The Fall of Electronic Arts and the Rise of Activision, where they just shit-talk EA for an entire page. Quote, to fund Electronic Arts' desperate motive to conspire to break these legal contracts ahead of their expiration dates, all one has to do is look at the company's precipitous decline in stature with investors and, most importantly, in the eyes of game players who demand innovation and excitement. Quote, Electronic Arts hoped its recent Battlefield Bad Company series would be its answer to Call of Duty, but its lackluster sales and audience disappointment had little impact on Activision's success in the genre. I think the most surprising thing to me is how unprofessional this document is. It goes out of its way to attack both EA and Vince and Jason 
presenting one as a sad, dying corporation and the other as a pair of money-grubbing, disloyal workers. This document doesn't really feel like a legal document to be used in court. Now, this is not my area of expertise, so perhaps this is quite common, but it just struck me as odd. It is a bit crazy, however, just how stark the difference is when comparing Activision's document with Vince and Jason's. First off, it's much shorter. Their document is only 20 pages, while Activision's is 70 pages long. Perhaps the most notable differences are the framing and style of the documents. For example, in its 20-page document, the plaintiff document refers back to 39 various precedent-setting court cases and laws to make their case. In its 70-page document, Activision refers back to only one law to state that Vince and Jason broke it and owe them money because of it. Now, to be clear, Activision does have evidence in the form of contracts, documents, and emails that it refers back to often, but that's all they refer to. Let's take a look at Jason and Vince's actual case. The crux of their case rests on two key things. The conversation they had with CEO Bobby Kotick at the signing of the MOU, the one I told you to remember, and Activision's actions after the signing of the MOU. When signing, both were worried about the fact that all the benefits offered would be stripped away if they were to be fired from Activision, as we stated earlier. As far as they understood it from Bobby's reply, this MOU would put them on par with other executive employees and how they were fired. This, however, turned out not to be the case. The argument for Jason and Vince is that these claims were a large part of the fraud alleged, as they were both assured that they could not be fired, then Activision immediately conspired to do so. And as far as I can tell, there's a fair amount of legal precedent to back that up. Misrepresentation via implication seems to be enough to legally constitute fraud. Quote, As to the law, Activision boldly claims that a business can commit fraud and get away with it by choosing words that are literally true. In Activision's view, deception is lawful so long as it is accomplished through implication and suggestion. As to the facts, Activision impermissibly asked this court to find the plaintiff's understanding of the MOU was a figment of their imagination instead of what Kodak intended them to believe by his statements. This is an issue to be decided by the jury. The second part of their argument alleges they can prove that Activision never intended to honor the promises from the MOU in the first place. There are multiple pieces of evidence for this. Firstly, a conversation between two senior executive members and two lead employees. In that conversation, the executives were asked point blank why the two were fired, to which they responded, quote, The deal Jason and Vince made was way too good. One of them adding that with the MOU in place, quote, Activision didn't have any control of Modern Warfare 2, so they couldn't make Modern Warfare 3, which would have been the sequel to Modern Warfare 2, which was the hugest game ever, and that Weston Zimpella virtually had a gun to Bobby's head when they signed that contract. Finishing off by saying, quote, there's no way Bobby was ever going to honor this contract. There is also a variety of circumstantial evidence provided to show that Activision never intended to honor the MOU. I won't go through them all, but there were a few that I thought were noteworthy. First off, the MOU is a crazy document with even crazier promises unlike anything seen before or after in the gaming industry. In effect, the MOU handed over control of Activision's largest franchise to Weston Zimpella and promised them a ton of money to keep that control. In addition, Activision executives seemed to regret the MOU in private emails that were presented. Executives said they were, quote, over the two, that they were unhappy with their creative authority, complained about how much money they were making, and at one point, a few months before they were fired, said they would, quote, have Vince and Jason's compensation to be used elsewhere. They never mentioned the MOU and its implications to other key employees, such as all of Treyarch or the executive in charge of marketing. There were also clear violations of the MOU. For example, Activision allowing Treyarch to use Modern Warfare 2 assets in Black Ops, giving Sledgehammer the go-ahead to work on modern titles, or perhaps the most egregious one being Treyarch creating the Wii port of Modern Warfare without the permission or even knowledge of Jason and Vince. When the two found out, they confronted an executive who said that the game had not been approved and that production of it would stop, when in reality all he did was remove Jason and Vince from the mailing list and told Treyarch to continue production. It was released on November 10th, 2009. The end of the trial is a bit anticlimactic, as it never reached the courtroom. A settlement was reached between the two parties, but that settlement is and continues to remain completely confidential. When questioned right after the settlement, West refused to comment, but reportedly did seem happy. An official statement from Activision goes as follows, quote, The company does not believe that the incremental one-time charges related to the settlement will result in a material impact on a GAP or non-GAP earnings per share outlook for the current quarter or the calendar year due to the stronger than expected operating performance in the current quarter. 
Now, I'm not going to try and draw a conclusion about the legality of each side and under the law who is right or wrong. Frankly, it's far too outside my area of expertise. I will, however, try my best to guess at what actually happened. This is all conjecture, so please take this with a grain of salt. I think Activision never intended to honor the MOU. The internal conversations and emails just seem so damning. Pair that with the fact that the MOU is an unprecedented document and that Activision has no short history of being shady, it seems the most likely to me considering how badly they wanted a sequel to COD 4. I also think Activision weren't exactly great at hiding that they weren't going to honor it, as there were multiple instances where they just didn't. In response, I think Jason and Vince started looking for other options outside of Activision, as they weren't happy with their treatment at Activision before the MOU, and I certainly don't think they were happy after. So I don't believe that the meetings with EA were as innocent as they claim, and based on the internal EA emails, which again I won't show in this video but can be found in the unredacted document in the description, it seems some sort of deal was struck. The speed at which Respawn Entertainment was launched after their firing lends credence to that. Overall, I think both sides did some things that were a bit shady, with Activision clearly being more in the wrong here, and definitely deserved to pay out to Vince and Jason. That's again open interpretation though. Unfortunately, the tale doesn't end there. Behind the scenes, the lawsuit took its toll out personally on many of the developers over at Respawn. At first, Respawn Entertainment seemed like a safe haven for disgruntled Infinity Ward workers who felt that they were not being adequately compensated for their time on Modern Warfare 2, as Activision decided to withhold 60% of their bonuses until Modern Warfare 3 was finished. The team came together with nothing. Literally. At the start of Respawn, their office literally didn't even have chairs, let alone computers to work with. Team members each took their turn, pitching various ideas for games, many of them having concept art created and even some early demos. It's honestly an interesting insight into the early development process, and the team had no shortage of ideas. Fish says, you know, we gotta, keep the, we gotta get to the turrets because McLean is screaming that the ship is not taking off. It's like, and it's not leaving. So he says, you gotta find us some time. In fact, uh, we'll figure out how to get things going again. So Fish says, all right, we'll take care of it. So they run through the ship's corridor into the ball turret, and there's like two ball turrets like this. So you get into the right one, Fish gets into the left one, you're locked in, you see all these creatures coming at you, and you're just <laughs> gunning them down. Of course, at the same time, Vector's saying, keep them off the Marvins, and these Marvins are uh, this utility service robots that serve our ship, and we have a collection of about eight of them. And they're running along, they have little rolling hands, and they're like, Trying to make adjustments to the ship. Try that, try that. Everyone at Respawn was very conscious of the fact that the last time they decided on a game, they spent the next eight years making more of it, so they wanted to get it right this time. However, this would be indicative of a problem moving forward. Near the end of 2010, almost half a year since the formation of Respawn, the team still felt like there was no clear direction. West and Zampella had to constantly drive to another city to meet with their lawyer about the billion dollar lawsuit they were a part of. To say they were distracted is an understatement. Quote, if Jason wasn't around, it wasn't really worth talking about the design because it wouldn't go anywhere, says Sean Slyback. Quote, we didn't have a game, we didn't have our money, and we barely had a game engine, says Chris Lambert in regards to the end of 2010. The issue would be exacerbated as Respawn grew. Of the 75 employees in Respawn by mid-2011, about 40 or so were a part of the Infinity Ward employee group. There was a split between those who were in the lawsuit and those who weren't. On certain days, half of the team would go into meetings with lawyers about the lawsuit while the other half stayed and worked. The lawsuit was time-consuming, stressful, and expensive. Many were starting to feel the pressure, which affected Respawn's progress. Jason West especially seemed to be feeling the pressure. His attendance at meetings was shoddy at best. In one breath, he would tell the group to run with what they had, and in another, he would come in and demand a bunch of changes. Regardless, the team felt like West wasn't around enough. Eventually, things came to a head when Steve Fukuda was able to convince Jason to temporarily put him in charge until the lawsuit was over. Designer Slayback commented on this moment, quote, I think around then, Jason started to lose his passion for the project. What happened reminded me of a quote I heard from Josh on Queens of the Stone Age. He said passion isn't something you always have. You lose it. You have to chase it, and sometimes it chases you. I think Jason wanted to make games, not sit in depositions, but he didn't have a choice. Something changed in Jason. Even when the lawsuit was over, Jason and Vince's relationship was irreparably damaged. The two would no longer see eye to eye, and the team seemed to have lost its faith in Jason. Tensions rose until on February 1st, 2013, Jason left Respawn. 
The lawsuit had destroyed one of the great gaming duos, the likes responsible for Medal of Honor, Allied Assault, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, and Modern Warfare 2. Jason was the leader behind these games and many more, and left the gaming scene for six years. In 2019, he joined Epic Games in some capacity, but it has never been stated what exactly he was doing or working on, and I have yet to find any evidence of any work three years later. However, based on a report from Topio Networks, his position seems to be head of games. So, what kind of conclusions can be drawn from all of this? Well, first off, I think it's important to remember just how hard game development can be. It's not always as simple as it looks from the outside looking in. Two, there is no limit to what these publishers will do to make a quick buck. I know this is something that's sort of well known now, but it's still important to remember regardless. It's just sad to me that there were so many wonderful games Jason and Vince could have made that the world will never see because of this lawsuit and Activision's greed. At least the story isn't all doom and gloom. Respawn has gone on to release multiple fantastic titles, Titanfall 1 and 2, Jedi Fallen Order, Apex Legends, and they even went back to their roots and made Medal of Honor above and beyond. That's all we can ask for. Infinity Ward went on to continue to make Call of Duty games and seemingly will for the rest of time, as Jason and Vince predicted. One interesting turn of events was back in 2019 when many of the original members of Infinity Ward who left returned to make a new Modern Warfare. Just last year, they released a sequel with the same name, Modern Warfare 2. I guess only time will tell if history repeats itself. All right, I want to thank you for watching if you watched the entire thing. Um, this is my unscripted outro. I want to give you a heads up. This one might be a bit long. I have a couple things I want to cover. So um, the video is done. If you got to this point and you're like, I don't want to listen to the rest of this, you're totally fine. Um, but first off, I want to say that this video has been an undertaking. I know I've been uh, away for a little while, but I've actually been working on this video off and on for technically, I believe, four years. It actually originally started as a review of Modern Warfare 2. Um, I played through the entire single-player campaign for the review, and I did not end up using any of the footage for it, so that's fun. Um, I also played through all of the Spec Ops missions, and I played some multiplayer. I was going to review the entire game. And um, after I played it and I kind of got to that point, I realized I didn't have a whole lot to say about it. I realized that I liked the game, but trying to critically analyze it was not really kind of where I was at. And it was one of the things that I realized, too. Um, if you watched my Last of Us video, Last of Us Part 2, I really felt like I did a really good job of analyzing and critiquing that game. But that was because I had a lot to say. And I thought that that was going to be my path forward. I was like, well, I enjoy this. I want to continue to review games specifically. Um, and I found that, like, when I tried Modern Warfare 2, which is a game I'd always, you know, I, I thought I thought I had a lot to say. I didn't really have a whole lot to say at all. I, so that was interesting for me. Um, but while I was researching that video, I kind of stumbled upon this story again. I remember hearing about the story of, uh, you know, the firing of, of Vince and Zampella. No, Jason and Jason and Zampella. Sorry. Um, I remember hearing about their um, their firing back when it happened um, when I was like 14. And I was kind of the last I heard of it. I didn't really know much of the rest of the story. And I just kind of went down a rabbit hole. And then I found the court cases. And I just kind of felt like this was the story I needed to tell. Or at least I wanted to tell. And it was very interesting because this kind of took on a life of its own. I've never in my life taken on a project or attempted to do something with so much information. There's a lot of info when it comes to this court case, when it comes to the story. And I tried to condense it as best as I can. And I, you know, I'm really proud of the script. I think I did do a good job. But um, there's a lot that was left on the cutting room floor. So there's a lot that could have been put in here. You could have easily, I could have easily made this video another half hour long, even longer. Um, but I wanted to try and keep it really short, succinct, to the point. Um, which is funny when you make a video that's almost half an hour long um, without the outro. So there are a couple things I did want to just kind of go over really quickly before we end here. Um, but yeah, no, uh, the re researching this video was like insanely cool. I felt like I was a detective. I was pulling up old things. Um, the, at the end there, there's the, the final hours of Titanfall, which I highly recommend to give out a, give a look. There's a lot of really cool information and backstory that I did not fully go into, um, in that game. It's available on steam for like a dollar, but, um, I don't, I don't remember. It's been a, it's been a little while since I did this to be honest with you, but, um, 
it won't run if you buy it and then you try to just run it on like a normal computer. I think it either ran on Flash or some other old um, programming software. And so uh, you'll need to download something special. You can look it up online. It's, I, I, if I could do it, you could do it. But um, it won't run immediately. So don't panic if that happens. But it was really cool. Um, and the dude makes other ones like the final hours of some other games are a bit old, about 10 years old at this point. But it's pretty cool. Um, so a couple things I want to, a couple anecdotes or little things I want to mention. Um, so first off the infinity ward group, I kind of touched on, um, there's a lot more to that side of the story. I really focused on, um, the two head executives again, um, Vince and Jason. Um, but there's a lot of other secondary characters in the infinity ward group that I kind of touched on that I didn't really talk about. So, you know, there's a lot of information there. Um, let's see here. Oh, this story trailer, uh, for the, sorry, the story for the trailer, trailer, trailer. So Treyarch released a trailer. Um, for I believe it was Black Ops or it may have been World of War. I actually don't remember. It's been a little while since I looked at this, but basically, um, they were, uh, Vince and Jason were really mad about what was happening with like the, um, the pr production of Call of Duty and stuff like that. And so they released a trailer the same day, uh, that Treyarch did just to fuck with them. And there's an internal email that again, I think is confidential that I can't show that shows that they did it specifically to fuck with Treyarch. So I thought that was kind of funny. There's like beef between the two companies. Um, Let's see here. Oh, um, there's another interview that I did not get to show. Um, it it's really good. It's an interview with Vince Impella on September 16th, 2009. So this is like two months before Modern Warfare 2 would have released, and it's like a question and answer kind of thing. And I think it's really fascinating because it's got a lot of really juicy information in here. Um, I think the most the most interesting thing is, or there's two things. Um. He talks about why they dropped the Call of Duty name for Modern Warfare 2, and he kind of—he I actually thought this was a cool um, reasoning. They—they they likened it to Star Wars, so you know, like in Star Wars, um, when it comes to e like episodes four, five, and six, they, you know, you don't call it Star Wars: The Empire Strikes Back. You call it The Empire Strikes Back. He wanted them, someone, to do the same thing with Call of Duty. They wanted Modern Warfare 2 to be called Modern Warfare 2, not Call of Duty 6, which is interesting. So that was like one of the reasons that they did that. Which, you know, knowing everything we know, maybe it could be a bit of a it's true but not the full reason but i'm not sure and then the, the, he did they did bring up the Wii port actually which is really interesting and uh he did not seem happy about the Wii port in his answers um which is very interesting so that's linked in my references that's reference actually i'll tell you right now that's reference number 27 so if you want to go give that a read it's really short and awesome um last thing i'll leave you with here and then i'm going to end the video here I wanted to read, so there's this thing called The Art of Titanfall. It's a book of all the art of Titanfall. And there's an afterword uh, written by uh, Vince Impella. Um, and this is after Jason had left. This is after the court case had settled. Um, and after the game, I believe the game had launched at this point. And I thought it was really interesting. So it's a couple paragraphs. I want to read it real quick. Um, and then we'll be done. So I want to read this real quick. It starts with a quote. It says, I seldom end up where I wanted to go, but almost always end up where I need to be. Douglas Adams, a long... Uh, dark tea time of the soul. So here is Vince Impella's words. The last five years have been a wild ride. I have seen people I admire do things that made me sad and confused. I have seen people stand up for what they believe in, believe is right, no matter the cost. The journey here was costly financially, but more importantly, emotionally. There were dark times where it seemed it might be better to walk away. What kept things going? I don't know if I can fully answer that, except to say that there were people I worked with that deserved it to continue. Respawn needed to push forward. I needed to push forward. And push forward we have. Respawn is an amazing place full of productive and self-motivated developers who are the best uh, at their craft. People who choose to believe in Respawn and our vision um, and not push for the safe bets. Titanfall was born from this chaos. When was it born? I can't rightly say. There were sparks uh, flown out early, but they didn't at the scroll. They didn't ignite immediately. How was it born out of a desire to do something different and a need to manage the scope of what was possible? We were starting over. We had limited time and resources. We had the focus down to the core. This is the this is a game, and we know how to make games. There was never a clear path of how this one would come to be, but the result is rooted in the art and the artists that built the foundation of our worlds and cemented our universe together given the turbulence of our start we all really needed the game to find an audience when we really unveil uh, when we finally unveiled the game it took off beyond anything we could have hoped most of all we want to deliver on the promise of respawn the team sorry the team here is giving 
uh, this game their soul. All of the beauty and the ugly of the past years pounded into hope. We have respawned. And I think that uh, kind of message really resonated with me, especially after reading all of this and making this video. So I hope that you've enjoyed, and I'll catch you in the next one.